Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it, as always, doing another video one because I know you guys like the video. I was doing audio for a long time, but the video, uh, get a lot more comments on it. People really like, seem to like to see the screen. What am I looking at? And uh, what I'm seeing here today was mostly green, although not as bright as it was earlier in the day. We'll go through that in just a minute, but you can see the Dow Jones Industrials once again failing to get back above 13,000 and stay. Uh, it, it, it did it a couple days ago, of course, and yesterday we had what seemed like a big sell-off, even though it was only 50-some-odd points, but relative to what we've been seeing in 2012, uh, big sell-off. But today, the industrials up 28 points to finish at $12,980. Excuse me, 12980 is the points, not dollars. The uh, transports, actually, we've been talking about that, how they've been lagging, and that is something that is, was a big concern, obviously, with oil prices going up. Many of those transport companies, those stocks have been falling. So the transports actually were very strong today. And if you're bullish, that is a good sign. Uh, you can see the S&P 500 down there at 1374, up about 8.4 points. And as we go through all the different, uh, different uh, indexes here, you can see all of those. Uh, financials did pretty well today as well. The uh, Russell 2000 up a half a percent. So uh, lagged the S&P, but uh, was leading the way earlier in the day and, and really sold off late in the day. So Russell 2000, uh, really, I think you need the Russell 2000 to be leading. I think you need transports to be, to be leading. And then you need financials and semiconductors to be participating in the rally. And so far, most of this you know, last few months, we've had that. A couple of weeks, you've seen that change a little bit. And so, again, that's got me very cautious in the short run. You can see the market is, as opposed to being down in the morning and up in the afternoon, it's up in the morning and selling off in the afternoon. And so uh, that's a concern, at least at least short term. So here's the uh, S&P, kind of a five-minute chart throughout the day, uh, as it's been doing, climbing higher, very hot out of the gate, sold off a little bit, works its way higher. Ben Bernanke speaking, didn't really have an impact today like it did yesterday. And then uh, it starts to roll over, get a little weaker. It intensifies throughout the last couple of hours. We'll get to some of the reasons in just a minute. One of them was an uh, oil explosion. And then we see it rally into the close, but still finished off of its highs. Of course, the Dow Jones, like I mentioned, was over 13,000, but couldn't hold it today. So I think what you're starting to see is the stock market moving a little sideways, even though there's plenty of stocks still making new highs. Now, one of the things that got uh, the market a uh, little spooked this afternoon was there was a, uh, a report. It started out as a rumor, but uh, now there's pictures of it of a Saudi oil explosion. And, of course, with oil already above 100, firmly above 100, and a, a tax on the consumer, we know that, and a fragile economy, even if you're, even if you're bullish and you think the economy's getting better and improving, it's still very, very susceptible to any type of shock or any type of situation that can cause the consumer to scale back at all because they're already very fragile and of course there's a lot of people over 50 percent of the people in this country don't even pay any income taxes which means a lot of them aren't making any income but uh but if you look here this is the price of oil today and you can see it was humming along at around 107 or so and then we took uh, it started to head up as the day went on and then we had a big spike uh, just a little bit ago, and we crossed over the 110 per barrel uh, mark. And so, uh, and that's really where it is right now, $110 a barrel. And again, that was because of this uh, oil explosion. Now, remember, you got competing things going on here. Talked to a gentleman today in the oil industry. He says he uh, has been has been looking at several reports, and uh, a lot of people feel like demand is starting to fall off. And that would make sense in a lethargic economy like we have. The bulls would say, well, no, oil's going up because demand's getting stronger. Then you have supply side of things. And you've got, obviously, you see what's happening with natural gas. But you have supply of oil. And, of course, you know, the, the, the Eagleford shell and the Balkan shell. And you've got these supply situations. So you've got the demand, the supply. You have the Fed, of course, still printing more money, which is inflationary and debasing their currencies. And here we have uh, oil going up. 
So it'll be interesting to see how this resolves itself. But I can tell you one thing that, again, if this was a vibrant economy like we had, oh, you know, in the 80s and 90s, if this was an economy that was humming along pretty good, you would say, well, higher oil prices uh, would be justified because more people are working, more people are driving, uh, everything looks fine, and they would be going up proportionally to other things. Unfortunately, what's happening is oil is becoming a bigger and bigger part of people's lives, or I should say gasoline, because, look, I, I, and I've talked about it before, I don't know what the actual tipping point is to cause people to actually change their actual driving habits, but whenever gasoline starts approaching 4 $5, whatever it's going to be, it definitely is a tax on the consumer, and that, again, right now, when people are really pinching pennies, most of America, uh, you know, you, you have to look at that and say, uh-oh, something's going on here, and, you know, obviously, this is, this is a big headwind for consumers. Now, a contradictory report came out today with the uh, chain store sales, and you can see this is a, uh, a comparison here, basically year over year, it's chain store sales, and it came out at 6.7% where it, the estimate was for 3.5%, so much higher than anticipated. Now, the older number was revised down a little bit, but you can see this chart. This goes all the way back to 2006, and obviously this was had been declining, 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 coming into 07 and 08. So again, we saw a precursor to this coming into 2007 and 08, and, and there was a lot of things like this that were telling you that things were getting weaker in 07, um, and then, of course, the stock market finally realized it in 2008. And we'll, I'll show you another uh, chart in just a minute. And then, of course, it turned around in early 2009, really bottomed out late 2008. So the economy started improving a little bit before we made the March 2009 bottoms in the stock market. You know, you could argue this thing was kind of rolling over and uh, starting to at least flatten out. But uh, we have this latest report here. Now, that could get revised. We know that as well. But, again, it gave the bulls something to say, you know what, things aren't falling off a cliff. If they were, this would continue to be falling. It's not. It's popping back up. So how can the consumer be facing higher gas prices, yet restaurant stocks are still doing very well, despite higher prices at those restaurants? I mean, we've seen a lot of restaurants raise prices lately. How can the consumer continue to go out to eat, continue to uh, spend money at these retailers? Well, I think here's here's one answer. <laughs> this is a stock I would love to have. Been trying to to buy it, but it doesn't seem to come down. Is Mastercard, and I don't have a position in it. I'm not re recommending buying it right now. But Mastercard, remember, this is a company that gets paid for people using their credit cards. So they get paid by the swipe. They don't hold the debt. Neither does Visa. Uh, American Express does hold the debt, so it's a different story. But Visa and Mastercard look like this. And I think more and more people, and this went back to a few years ago, I talked about when the economy was so weak back then, saying more and more people are going to rely on their credit cards, not just use it as a, a convenient method of commerce. And now not only are they relying on it, but apparently they're still going out buying the phones and the iPads, and they're going out to eat at restaurants. So uh, this is, to me, almost the bridge loan or the financing that the consumer is using right now. Uh, this is going to be tapped, and you can see already there's been a lot of overall credit in this country has contracted for a lot of people, and you can only borrow so much. So this is something that long-term can't continue, but right now this is, I think, the answer is where people are, they're living credit card to credit card, and every time they swipe it, MasterCard gets a piece of it, and uh, the stock you can see has doubled really just in the last uh, maybe 18 months or so and from 200 all the way up to over $400 a share. There's been a lot of uh, economic reports lately. They've come out better than expected. We've talked about that, that a lot of them, flawed as they are, have come out better than expected. And, of course, that's all the media uh, grabs onto is, were they better than the estimates? doesn't matter if the estimates are right or wrong. Are they better than the estimates? And a lot of them have been better than the estimates, and I think that's a big reason why the stock market has, uh, has gone up to this almost 13,000 level. Of course, we're sitting at 12,980, and the uh, NASDAQ at 2,988. They, they don't seem to be able to go over these, uh, these milestone numbers. But what you're looking at on the screen is the orange is the S&P 500, and in the blue is the ISM manufacturing report. So it, it's, a, it's basically a, uh, a, a number that comes out 
that tells us how the economy is doing from the manufacturing side. And obviously, this has gotten much better since early 2009, as has the stock market. And it's obviously a very correlated uh, number with the stock market. But one thing I want to point out is, notice, again, in blue here, Notice that when this line goes below 50, and 50 is kind of your bogey for is the economy contracting or expanding. Notice when it went, ab when it went ab uh, below it here in late 2000, the stock market, when it went below it and it was decisively below it, then the stock market peaked. And that, of course, was in March of 2000. I think it was March 10th of 2000, as a matter of fact. And uh, so you can see it peaked out, and that was the time the stock market headed on down. And then we crossed back above it here, in early 2002 and uh, we went above it, above it pretty firmly and the stock market was going up but then when it went back below it again the stock market continued to, to go down once we went back above it and stayed there uh, off we went to the races and so you can see it rallied up this is the stock market through 03, 04 that recovery phase but as we moved along this number continued to get weaker but you notice it didn't affect the stock market so even though manufacturing was slowing down in the mid 2000s and it was a slower number it stayed above that bogey number of 50 and once it decidedly went below it here and you can see it went below it hit up against 50 and then finally it could not be back above 50 that was the time right there where the uh, where it was really really that was your last chance to get out in 2008 now, it had already started to flirt with it back in late 07. And uh, for many of you, remember at the time, the stock market was making new highs in late 2007. And I was doing podcasts and radio shows and TV interviews at the time saying, the economy is weaker than most people believe. And it wasn't, it wasn't uh, necessarily from this indicator. There were several indicators that had been weakening for some time. But when this went below 50, and you had a combination of other leading indicators that were falling... The, the gap became too big, and obviously that combined with technicals. We look at the fundamentals. We say, you know what, this is weak, this is weak, this is weak, but what are the technicals telling us? The technicals were starting to weaken as well in 2007, and so it was a very early warning sign. Now what we've seen, let's fast forward until to uh, 2011-12, and what you notice is, again, starting to see this, this round off, this blue line, getting more negative once again, but it's still at 52.4. So even though it came out above, or excuse me, below expectations, because expectations were for 54.5 this morning, and it only came out at 52.4, it uh, it's still it's still heading in that direction, but it's still above 50. So watch this over the next few months. If you see the ISM manufacturing hit that 50, that's when I think you're going to start to see investors really get nervous about this, because that's going to be your time now. Does it bounce off of 50? Is it just a couple of months? I think eventually this thing's going to go through 50, especially if oil prices stay where they are right now. And uh, again, you, you, you don't have uh, a big tailwind of things that are going to make this economy grow. So I think even though there's individual companies doing extremely well and companies that are profiting re really regardless of what's going on, I don't think you're going to, uh, to, to see this economy really thrive. So let's watch for that over the next few months is d does this ISM manufacturing number drop down below 50 and then stay decidedly below it and if it does then you will see the market not just have a correction but then potentially turn into some type of uh, bear market wanted to talk about uh, gold and silver real quick of course yesterday uh, we saw a big big drop in gold and silver partially because of what you saw with uh, uh, Ben Bernanke's testimony perhaps bringing it down a notch like he's not going to be as dovish as he has been. I find that very hard to believe. I think he's going to continue to do what he does and what he the only thing he knows how to do. So, uh, you know, you saw the big sell-off in gold, though, and it kind of sparked a whole almost not a flash crash type of situation, but definitely everybody, tr too many people trying to leave the exits at the same time, pushing gold down quite a bit. And, uh, you know, here's a picture of gold, and you can see the long bar over here that was yesterday's price action uh, a lot of people pointing out that not only did we get a daily uh, reversal where it made new highs and then it reversed and made new lows it did that for the day the week and the month and so it got a lot of technic te uh, technicians and people that look at the the charts of this really really concerned and a lot of those people are now of course exiting and you know they flip-flop every day 
I still go back to looking at this from a little bit longer term perspective. I think gold and silver do beg to be traded. But if you look at this from a little bit longer term perspective, we know that, as we talked about in previous podcasts, you know, gold broke out of this little downtrend and uh, was off to the races until yesterday. Had a good day today, up about a percent and a half, uh, getting back some of those losses from yesterday. But notice the pink line, the 50-day moving average against the 200. Yesterday didn't really affect it. The 50-day still still moving up. And, of course, if you switch it to a weekly, that's what your weekly picture looks like. So you can see that even though it was a big move yesterday, you still have mostly vibration right now. And, again, if, you, if you're somebody that's been bullish of gold the last several years or you're wanting to find a reason to sell it at some point, you know, wait till this trend changes, not just not just a daily uh, vibration. But, yeah, it's a big move. It's something to get our attention. But, uh, you know, given what Bernanke said yesterday, that didn't change my mind. I don't think he's going to let his off the accelerator uh, anytime soon. And I would say with silver, it's the same story. I would say depending on how risky you are, uh, you know, I, I own silver and gold, and I own them for two different strategies. Silver I own is more of a uh, little bit quicker trade. I uh, started to see a lot of options volume in the last few days in uh, silver calls, and uh, that was one of the reasons that I bought it, and it broke out technically. It looked pretty good, and so had a really good day the day before yesterday. So that was on Tuesday, and then, of course, yesterday comes in and just got slaughtered, made a new high, as you can see from the, the, the bar here, made a new high and then reversed and finished not on the lows of the day but fairly close to it. Had a good, strong day today, up about 2.68% or $0.90 cents on the SLV, which is the ETF for silver. So, again, same kind of deal as, as gold. They're going to move similarly. The one thing about silver and gold that you have to watch out for is now that we have this volatility back, remember, one of the things they can do they, meaning these uh, exchanges and so forth, is they can raise the margin requirements for silver and gold. And that's what we saw back in uh, a few months ago. You see these big drops here. It was because they changed the margin requirements. So they can change the rules of the game in midstream. And when they do that and they raise the margin requirements, people have to either put more money in or the natural thing to do is to sell their position to get down to a, 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 a ratio that works out. So be careful that because it doesn't just have to go down, uh, you know, for for this to to uh, to happen. I mean, silver can just be a little more volatile, and that can cause the margin requirements to go up on silver and gold. So that's something to watch out for. But uh, but uh, you know, I don't have huge positions in these, but it's something I'm hanging on to right now because it still to me looks like vibration. It scared a lot of people out yesterday. I had huge volume, 90 million shares traded yesterday, uh, but it didn't uh, it didn't uh, scare me out yesterday. All right, folks, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it, as always. Have a wonderful day. CarlEggers.com, Twitter.com slash CarlEggers, EggersCapital.com, all of that fun stuff. Keep the emails coming, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.